My name is Jessica Knapp, and tonight Blake and Mason will explain the who, the what, the where, the when, and the whys of the Road to Vimy 2017 Lest We Forget project. We as Canadians and Canada's History Society have been generating a lot of discussion about the First World War recently, and for good reason. Even though 100 years have passed since the beginning of the Great War, there are still many unknowns and there are still many ways to involve each new generation in remembering and understanding our many histories. So where it may seem like a repetition of content, it is not. And where it may seem like a repetition of content, it needs to be heard. So before I let Blake and Mason take over, I am going to give you a brief introduction of the Society national charitable organization dedicated to making Canadian history popular for a general audience. We do this in a number of ways, including our flagship publications, Canada's History Magazine, formerly known as The Beaver, and Kayak, Canada's History Magazine for Kids. We have our website, which is canadashistory.ca, where we host webinar series, post original online content, and engage through social media with our various audiences. We also present a number of awards, many of which are the Governor General's History Awards, which are Canada's top honors in the field of history and heritage. They celebrate the very best in Canadian achievements to ensure our national past has a vibrant presence in our society today. Blake was awarded the Governor General's History Award for Excellence in Teaching in 2006 and has continued to be an active member of our GG alumni. This award was created in 1996 to recognize exceptional history educators and to encourage greater collaboration and exchange of ideas within Canada's teaching community. Since 1996, Canada's history has celebrated hundreds of recipients and finalists while creating a national network of enthusiastic and innovative history teachers. The call for the 2015 nominations and applications is now closed, but it's not too early to begin your application for 2016. You can watch for the announcement of this year's recipients in, in the fall. In the category of teaching, we have one additional award through the Government of Canada. This is called the Government of Canada Teaching Award. This teaching award asks teachers to submit high school level lesson plans and project based, based on one of three themes. This year's themes include Symbols of Canada, World War II, and Canadian Prime Ministers. The deadline for this award has been extended from its original date of April 17th to May 4th. So if you were working on an application, you were thinking of working on an application, you still have time to complete it before the deadline is closed. So revisit that idea if you were over there before. If you are interested in knowing more about these awards, feel free to click on the links on the slide and bookmark them for a later viewing. At this time, I will pass tonight's presentation over to our presenters, Blake and Mason. Thank you for being so patient. So, uh, uh, Mason and I are just going to go through some uh, some of the PowerPoint that we've created as it comes up here. Um, okay. So here's the idea, folks. Um, Mason and I are just going to go through. Uh, what we're trying to do with uh, the Lost We Forget Vimy Project, Road to Vimy 2017 project. And feel free to ask any questions along the way, and we'll try to stop and answer them as we go. Blake and I are both a bit sporadic at times, so I'll kind of fly off the handle a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, so like we were saying earlier, really our purpose is simply to keep uh, students involved, give students a greater voice, let students be the custodians of the uh, of the centennial as much as possible. So the whole idea is there are 3,598 Canadians that were killed at Vimy and because uh, because all uh, Library and Archives is now digitizing the files, we thought this would be a great opportunity to have uh, the students and teachers working together uh, to create uh, something uh, like a, uh, um, I guess, a, a mission to control how Vimy is going to be interpreted, if that's possible. So, uh, Blackie and I are just going to go through 
uh, some of the some of the methods that we're trying to employ so that we can create students can create some sort of legacy around uh, Vimy. Okay. So the objectives for tonight are simple. Uh, we're, we'll talk a little bit about our project goals, the history, the facet of the project, time frames, resources that are available to us, and then different incentives that we've been able to work out with different partners or other organizations to encourage teachers and students uh, to participate. Okay, so essentially, our project goals are this. You guys can you guys can read them. It's the really it's it's got this whole curriculum undertone. We want students to be engaged in working with primary evidence, to be challenged by this evidence, and then to uh, establish biographies that can then be used uh, uh, in ever whichever way uh, uh, the teachers, students, community wants to, but also they can be used in a larger sense, and that is in the database and in the app, and we'll talk about that. Uh, and then the third point would be to um, uh, uh, Mason's class, and uh, what's been put online, and many of you are starting to access it, is the open source database, so that uh, by 2017, it can be manipulated by uh, anyone so that they can discover anything that they can about these soldiers uh, that were killed at Vimy. And then the last point is to do things like this, where we're able to network with each other, uh, try to problem solve any issues that arise, suggestions that people have. So we're really trying to make this a collaborative uh, endeavor. Uh, so here's some, just some of the things for us to be considering here. Uh, in our traditional approach in the classroom, more often than not, uh, it results in the, the subject of history being the second most disliked subject. What we want to be able to do is have it where, as students work through the evidence, it's contentious. Uh, there, uh, there should be conflicting points of view around, let's say, uh, uh, the prescribed narrative around Vimy, uh, and that through multiple sources, we should be able to have within our classroom multiple perspectives within these classrooms. Uh, the other thing that we kind of like about this idea is that when you're working with the primary evidence, that the history is quite messy. And the idea is uh, the last piece that we want to have with this is that. Because you're dealing with primary evidence, you let the evidence lead you to conclusions rather than, I think, in the more single narrative or prescriptive methodology that can be used in the classroom, that we already have an established conclusion and the evidence is just this, you know, this activity that we have going with the students. We want to be reversing that. We want to have it so that the evidence is part of our experiment that then leads us to the conclusion and that this is part of our everyday activity in the classroom. And the great thing about working inside the primary documents is that the students can come up with those conclusions on their own, and there's a lot of times that you can break away and have one student, after they're done investigating a certain area of a soldier's life or uh, the different things that they were involved in, that it can be a great teaching moment that can be tied into the rest of your curriculum. You can bring up all the students in the class together and start experimenting with some of those ideas. So we just had that. So we're just going to run this like it's a narrative. I was just, just going to say to Mason that I mean, even today uh, we had a film crew in the class. We're filming the kids, and uh, uh, the director for the film crew was asking the students about the significance of Vimy, and the two students were not quite sure what the significance of Vimy was. And, and I was not going to step in or try to say anything or try to, you know, correct, you know, anything. I, I wasn't interested in that. I was watching these students try to field this question and determine for themselves uh, the, the significance of Vimy. And even between the two students, they couldn't actually agree mm -hmm. amongst themselves. It was, it was quite a, an interesting moment. Yeah. And one of the things that I'm getting at, and uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm a computer science teacher and a math teacher. 
Uh, I was one of those students in high school that probably considered history one of my most hated subjects. And it really wasn't until I got into this project that I have a really great appreciation for it. So if you guys have any questions, Joanne, if you've got questions about it, so Joanne just signed up for, with 20, 20 of her students yesterday to get them working on some stuff, uh, working on the files. Uh, fire away any questions and, and we'll just uh, uh, we'll try to answer them as we go. All right, so we'll uh, just kind of go through the connection that Blake and I set up. So roughly about five years ago, uh, Blake uh, was seconded to the board and was on his way back into the classroom. And uh, he approached me about sort of continuing with the Lest We Forget project that he'd been working on for the past roughly about 10 years or so. And uh, so what we wanted to do was to try to add sort of a digital component. So up until that time, I'd been teaching strictly math classes from the start of my career. And at the same time, I was kind of being thrust back into um, teaching a computer programming class uh, after a couple of our computer science teachers had retired. So what Blake and I had decided to do was to allow the students to try to come up with an idea about how to take the primary um, uh, primary documents and to digitize it and to try to read the life out of the soldiers that fought and died uh, specifically on D-Day on Juneau Beach. So we were just looking at the Canadian soldiers, and that was our starting point. Everything from that point forward was a complete experiment where we allowed the students to completely run with it. They could design and implement everything, and we decided to, to build a phone app. Now, the only way that we could build the phone app was for the Windows Phone 8, uh, which I know many of you probably have never even seen before. It only holds about 1% of the market in Canada. But that was the, the software that we were going to use inside the schools, and that was sort of our experiment. At the very start of the project, when people heard about it, we, there was a lot of negativity that students would not be able to do this in a high school class because it really hadn't even been attempted inside most university classes before. So it really was a complete experiment. And Blake and I met probably every second or third night, just sort of spitballing ideas on what's working and what's not working. And then the idea was just to completely let the students take full control over every aspect of the app. So as a teacher, uh, both Blake and I just sort of stepped backwards and allowed the students to sort of um, just, you know, I think they just sort of went on in their own direction. And we were there for, as a facilitator to try to help them in any way that we could uh, to try to come up with these ideas, to try to motivate them. So, that project took roughly about two and a half years, and roughly about two weeks before the 75th anniversary, sorry, 70th anniversary of D-Day, um, we were actually accepted inside Microsoft's App Store uh, on the very first submission, which is extremely rare even for professional developers. And uh, it was released about a week before uh, the, the 70th anniversary. So we decided to take a bigger bite this time and to focus our attention on the Battle of Bimini. And uh, obviously, as I'm sure you're well aware, um, there are roughly about uh, 10 times the number of, of soldiers that uh, fought and died. So the amount of data that we're dealing with is pretty substantial, which means this is where you guys come in. I mean, when we're looking for, we figured it would take roughly about 150 teachers across Canada to look at all of the primary evidence um, to have each student take an individual soldier and then to populate our database based on the soldiers uh, that they're studying. So the idea behind that is that, is that if, we, if we're working together across the country to do this by our goal is by March of 2017 that collaboratively we will be able to get all 3,598 finished. Uh, the database would be populated. The app and suggestions that you folks have for app, app ideas, uh, please let me push them out there at us so that we can uh, uh, begin to incorporate these ideas uh, into the app. And the idea there is that. 
uh, by the centennial, we'll be able to say that students have been successful in uh, being the ones that have designed and taken over uh, the 3,598. Uh, so one of the things that we did is we proposed that, you know, uh, although it was great that we could work with the windows column, but we realized that the market share is not with the windows column. So if you guys by the pocket right now probably have an iPhone or you might have an iPad. So we made a proposal to our board and we were lucky enough to get um, a fully functional state-of-the-art Mac lab required in order to develop an iPad and an iPhone app. Uh, so this semester we just started the project really within the last week or so. The students are now starting to design what the next edition of the app is. Again, they take full control over absolutely every aspect of the app. Some of the things that they come up with is totally brilliant. That's where we're at right now. Now, at the same time, I'm actually teaching four classes. Two of them are business classes, and two of them are online science classes. And tap into the knowledge of a lot of computer programmers, not only in school, but across Ontario, so that students that don't have the programming course in their school, only one out of every ten school that comes across Canada has a computer science class that they can attend and participate in. So this sort of opens it up to a different student that would never have that opportunity and also contributing to something for the long time by developing. So if people have any questions or interesting so far, let us know. We're on the uh, app development slide here, and on the right-hand side, you'll see that's actually what the uh, the Juno Beach project app looks like uh, for Windows, UK history, maps, and regiments and regiments. So to answer Joanne's question, the app is going to take it's going to take at least two years to develop, and our hope is to make sure it gets out. For the centennial of the battle of Britain. Um, so with that comes a little bit of a challenge because I'm going to be dealing with new students every semester. So there is sort of a um, foundation that needs to be built in terms of computer programming, especially because the language that we're dealing with uh, is less than the Apple has actually developed their own language called Swift and which are one of the first uh, groups that will actually be taking on app development on this brand. And so, Joanne, your next, so the next group will pick up, yeah. So, the idea is that from the, from the primary evidence point of view, the biographies that are finished this semester are finished. A new crop of, uh, of students with new soldiers. Then, on the bio, it's like an accordion. So, we're Tight on it for two or three days in a week, and then we go off uh, and we explore other aspects of, let's say, 20th century Canadian history, and we try to make a connection to the primary documents. And then once we've explored those, we come back to the bio, uh, we work on that, and then questions emerge again, and that takes us off in different directions. So, for example, uh, last week we had some students that were interested. In when they were looking at uh, Vimy, they wanted to know about uh, the armaments, munitions, equipment that was in Vimy, and how it's different from the equipment that's used today. So we're using the primary evidence document as a platform that takes us off into different directions. Uh, we then explore the, uh, the advance of technology uh, over the 20th century and how that could affect, you know, different facets of our society and warfare. And when we've explored that, and that might take us four or five days, we then come back to the bio and work on the bios. And the kids bring up all kinds of questions. So it might be about family, it might be about community, it might be about economics, uh, women's rights, uh, all, all of these issues that come out of the primary evidence documents or questions that circle around the documents. And that allows us to walk in different directions. For the same respect, a lot of Blake students will then have an idea that's somehow connected to technology. Blake will send those students into my class, and then they'll start working with some of my students.
different aspects, whether it's the app or uh, from a business perspective. So for instance, we've been talking about ordering weaponry that we're consuming. I have one of my business students that is very fluent in my Google SketchUp and he can dimensional diagram of the capabilities the weapons and tanks and aircraft that we're or things that we're using inside Bimini. And, and Craig, your, your point too about uh, doing this as enrichment time, I have a lot of students that come in and kind of treat it the same way. They're doing their own research, but they then want to spend extra time on things. So they actually come back a little while later, uh, Thursday is usually the day, and they'll spend an hour and a half with me on Thursday after school working on, working on these assignments. I, I think what we'll do is we'll go to the next slide, and all we wanted to do was just provide people with uh, different facets of the project and what we're looking at. So just so that people are aware, uh, there are digitized service files uh, for the Great War. That's ongoing. Uh, within the next few months, the, uh, the expeditionary force files will be available in their entirety. Uh, we have the Second World War files. All the Kate killed in action files, you can order those if people are interested in that. Uh, the war diaries. Uh, the war diaries. Uh, the war diaries are available online, and I've made a link for it inside our um, PowerPoint here tonight. And as well, just so that people are aware, if you're interested in the Second World War, Normandy, uh, the Normandy Regiment war diaries have been put online by Wilfrid Laurier University. Uh, and so, one of the things that we're interested in, uh, of course, with the Teachers Battlefield Tour, many of you are alumni with the Battlefield Tour. Uh, this year it's going to be in the Netherlands. Uh, traditionally, it's France and Belgium, and then uh, we're looking to incorporate Italy as well. Uh, and then some of the digital applications with all this uh, is not just the primary evidence, but of course now we want people to start thinking about how to work with the database and the app that will then be developed out of that. Uh, so, Joanne, your question of what you're hoping comes out of the app, uh, the idea is that students have been able to look at primary evidence and change the lens so that, that people can now think about primary evidence through a digital lens. And that the app becomes, uh, for people, kind of a go-to so that they can manipulate the data, students can work with the data, teachers can work with the data, but that it's an open source. And in terms of the app de development, there's really only one thing I, I ask of the students, and it's to honor the soldiers that sacrificed their life. And that's really the starting point. And everything from that point forward is completely up to them. So, um, you know, what what is interesting to you guys, if you were going to download this app, what would you like to see in it? And those are sort of the starting points that we work with. And then they come up with uh, major themes. Uh, and different directions. Do they want to take a look at mapping? Do they want to take a look at um, the weaponry that, that was involved? Do they want to take a look at just searching, having the capability of searching inside the database? And like Blake said, to be able to manipulate the data in there. Uh, can we start to look at sociological uh, questions that might arise? How many of these soldiers were from rural communities across Canada? How many of them actually came from urban and drilling down to the type of data that uh, anyone really wants to take a look at. And Joanne, your idea about um, being able to, you know, students, let's say, being at a memorial and interacting, uh, you're touching on exactly uh, what we were working on with the Juno Beach Center. Uh, the idea that uh, anybody that had with a cell phone and go to the museum exhibit there, and on the back of each pillar post that represents a soldier killed at D-Day, you can actually uh, use your cell phone, scan the QR code, and up will pop the, a biography of the soldier written by students. 
Yeah, one of the, the features of the database itself is we just put in the capability of uploading different photos or different documents. It could be a PDF file or it could be a Word document that a student has created. And it allows the student to start building something just beyond the data and, and to start uh, compiling really any type of document. And it could be a family tree or a connection to phone numbers and uh, addresses of, of uh, family members that are still alive today that might be connected uh, with the soldiers. So we have that capability and we can actually use all of that information and feed it into the app. And that's really uh, where the students come in and they decide what information needs to go in the app to honor the soldiers. And, and I mean, we should probably just mention that I mean, Dave Alexander, Ryan McManahan, and uh, Pam Calvert uh, we're working with Mason and myself with the Juno, and I noticed that Dave is on here as well. And a shout out to Dave and the work that he and his students are doing uh, uh, as we then begin to work with the Vimy project. And really, let's be honest, who better to design an app other than the students and teenagers who are on their phones 24-7? And they, they know probably more than most of us on what should go in there, what's interesting, um, what's captivating, and what's going to keep people coming back. Yeah. And Joanne, your question about, uh, uh, you know, can it expand to look at all of the names at Vimy? Uh, the goal, actually, and the way that Mason and the students have designed the database has been populated, uh, you can then manipulate the files. You, you should, we should be able to, if we continue this, have have biographies or have uh, 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 maps on every single one of the soldiers that's there. And the hope is that as Library and Archives continues their digitization pro process, we now have the capacity to house the 1.8 million files that are housed inside Library and Archives. And you can just imagine the amount of information that's stored inside of those. and just the value to our, our community and to our nation to have this stuff that we can actually start drilling down and taking a look at some of the, the, the questions and the myths that are actually out there. So I've just moved, moved this on to the frame of time frames here for you. And again, everybody can take a look at this. Uh, our original goal was to have, uh, uh, we were hoping to have about 500 biographies finished uh, by the, uh, for this semester, uh, and we're over a thousand already, so we're way ahead of the game. It's created certain stresses uh, for us, but that's okay, that's, that's part of what we, we said that we get into in order to make sure that we, we can meet time frames and deadlines. So if you can, uh, again, the idea is that if you enjoy this and the students enjoy this this semester, uh, feel free, just contact us again. We'll get you another set of names and, uh, with links from Library and Archives. And we, our thought is that at this point, as our first push through, we've created, it's been rather seamless in that everything has worked quite well. Uh, so the idea is that in September we want to try the same thing, in February we want to try the same thing, September again we want to try the same thing. So we should be, we should have it so that if we follow, kind of follow along this rough time frame, we should be successful in making sure that we have biographical work that is finished, uh, uh, the app and the, uh, the database should be populated and the, uh, the app should be ready to go. Um, so all we want to do is just talk about the different links, and you folks can go through the different links that will help you out. Uh, one of the links that we have, um, the first one, Resources to the Road to Vimy. Uh, um, so the idea is it just if you click on it, there will be exemplars that will be uh, on the, um, uh, the left-hand side. The frame that we have here for Archivianet for online research tool, this is for the war diaries. So the, uh, access the war diaries. The war diaries are fabulous. Once the students know the battalion, 
They can then access the War Diary and do all the research on the War Diary. The next one, of course, is just our straight cenotaph, uh, uh, the, our uh, Lust We Forget project, and the exemplars, again, that are on the left-hand side. So if people are looking for a completed example, there's one right there. We also have, if you're looking for further research, there are links that are available uh, so that uh, students, the idea is that we want students to be challenged, but we, of course, we don't want it to be impossible. We want them to go through a nice, solid learning process that is curriculum in its orientation, involves all kinds of skills for them to be able to be successful in writing a biography. And, oh, sorry, Craig. Uh, yeah, look, I mean, it's not a problem. So here's what we've done. Craig has just said, you know, uh, you've sent me 20 some names, you'll get 12 done. Uh, if you let me know, uh, we have a master database here, uh, or sorry, an Excel spreadsheet here in which we're keeping track of who is doing which names, in which uh, we also have a column for which biographies are then completed. Uh, and we could just carry those over from one, uh, you know, from let's say February to June, and we could just start it up again in September. Um, the next link that we have, of course, is the uh, the link that we have for uh, the official history, which is now available online uh, through Department of History and Heritage. And then, then we're getting into the database. So the database is where your students will actually so enter all of their information. You can take a look on the left. The, there are some buttons on the page. And this is just a snapshot of the web page itself. I'm sure some of you guys are very familiar with this, uh, where you can add a soldier. Uh, students can stop midway through, because there is a lot of information that needs to go in there. Uh, they can edit a soldier later on, and they can continue uh, the process so they don't have to do it just in one shot. Uh, Marla Wales also came up with a uh, great Marla document Wales that you can use with your students. I'm going to post that probably this weekend, and it will just be a link, and it's a, it's a way to uh, create a hard copy for your students so that they can jot down the information that will eventually be needed to populate the database, and then it'll, it'll, it'll make the process a lot easier later on. Uh, So Duane, you just asked a question about where to put where to put the photo. Uh, one of the things that we've been talking about is if it's a high quality photo, it's really good to have that in the bio. But we've also added a feature with the idea that let's say a student is working on some uh, a student is working on a soldier. Uh, information comes from outside, or information comes later on, that that can actually be added uh, through the database. So we're, tr we're trying to make it uh, trying to make it so that it is a portal. It collects letters, photographs, as well as the bios. And then the app that we're developing will now look into the database, and it will also start uh, excuse me start looking for pictures and other files that we can incorporate into the app itself, whether it's a headshot or a photo with a regiment. Uh, so that just came online within the last few weeks. Uh, so it is sort of beta tested right now, so we're expecting some glitches. But give it a shot, see what you can do, see if you can add some files and some photos, and then uh, try to make it crash, and then we'll try to fix it. Here's, some, here's a couple of incentives that we've been able to work out with people. Uh, so the Vimy Foundation, for those teachers that actually have students that are working uh, on the Vimy project, uh, what we're going to do, what we're going to ask teachers to do is send your top two biographies that you believe uh, the student, a student has worked hard on or uh, the names of the two, two top students in your class. The Vimy Foundation will actually compile that list of names from the list of names that we are able to send them. Any questions for us? Yeah. Just to tie into the incentives to um, there's probably going to be a lot coming in in the next you know, few months or year. Uh, some things are in the works right now, but it hasn't been finalized, so I don't think it would be right for us to, to post it up there. Um, along with the other classes of Dave and Ryan and Pam Calvert uh, and Blake's students and my students, uh, they were uh, awarded with the Lieutenant Governor's Award last year for their work in, in terms of the heritage of, of Canada and the community. 
Um, and these things just tend to come out of nowhere <laughs> oftentimes, but uh, it was well deserved for the students. So does anybody have any questions? Mm -hmm. And to answer Joanne's question about the uh, outside students, it's, I mean, it's a little bit difficult to have students look at the app as it's in development because it's sort of customized um, in terms of an individual computer, and it's really difficult to actually submit that uh, during the test phase and during implementation and coding. But certainly later on, that's a great idea. And one of the nice things is that within every semester, as I get new students, they come up with brand new ideas, and we're always looking for more ideas. So if you guys you know, have some things that you think would be awesome inside the app or that your students, it would be useful for them. Or if you want to brainstorm with your class and come up with ideas, uh, they're always welcome. Uh, I'm fortunate that I have a handful of students that worked on the Juno Beach app with me, but they're grade 12 students and they're going to be moving on next year. So I'm hoping that some of the other students I'll get again next semester so that they can continue working with the app. And I'll be honest that it oftentimes takes probably about four or five weeks for students to get comfortable with the idea that they get to design their own assignments inside uh, inside a course that is tied in and connected to the curriculum of the course. And there's just this, this uh, fear that they just they want to know the answers. And when you're asking them to think about what they're trying to come up with, oftentimes that can cause some, some students um, in a classroom where they're sort of designing their own assignments to get comfortable with that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, like, I mean, it's, it's a great learning process, this whole idea of the voice in the classroom and, and this idea that it takes students about a month to, sh to reshape their thinking around the idea of being able to contribute, add, and design things rather than being told what to be doing. Yeah, so the database is like fully capable of handling any soldiers from, from World War One and World War Two right now. Um, and yeah, so Dave, we can we can use the database to start calculating average age, average age of when guys enlist, potentially maybe even the average age of guys that were conscripted, uh, the average age of guys that, that died. I mean, all of that information is right there at our fingertips, and we can start calculating whatever we need to or whatever we want to. And one of the challenges right now is, is if, if we're trying to look at search engines in order to be able to pull the data apart, if you folks have ideas about what that, what that might look like or what the options might be to pull that data apart, let us know. We're trying to do this as collaborative as possible. Yeah. And right now I have two students that are just starting to work on the search parameters inside the app. So this is perfect timing for some of those questions to pop out. And Bill, your question about uh, uh, will they have links to the hometowns of the soldiers and whatnot? Yeah, one of the features of the database itself is that you can pinpoint um, exact locations using a Google map uh, that records the GPS coordinates of basically every um, important place and time for a soldier. So, for instance, you can pinpoint the exact house that they grew up in or the exact hospital that they were born in, or you could even pinpoint their gravestone uh, in France. And what happens is, uh, in the last app that we did for the Juno Beach app, uh, the students came up with a great idea that you can actually progress through the life of a soldier by using maps, and it would uh, jump from one area to the next and sort of tie them and connect them together. And there's a lot of different things that we can do with that. We can create heat maps of um, where soldiers uh, were coming from, uh, and if you had an entire map of Canada, you could actually see the colors starting to get built from that. One of the things that I'm always interested in is uh, this idea that we were just a bunch of of uh, farm, farm boys that didn't know any better and whatnot. And a lot of the data that we're pulling from the files and whatnot is telling us that that's not accurate. They're, they're actually from the towns and cities across the country. They aren't, they aren't farm boys at all. So this is, again, 
uh, when we have the search engines that, that can then work to manipulate the data, this is kind of where we can go with this. How many were Catholic? How many Protestant? Uh, home, you know, yeah, hometowns. Like, I mean, all of that is built into this. So when you get into the database, you'll realize that the Veterans Affairs database um, it has nine fields of data. The database that Mason in his class have, has developed uh, has 150, 155 fields of data. So the data is quite extensive. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Joanne. And um, I think with every generation, we just lose that connection with uh, the sacrifice that all Canadians made during both wars and, and the fact that it really was a world war and every single person was affected by it. So I think the, the Vimy project and the Less We Forget project is a great way of tying that back into the community of the students, especially when you're dealing with um, soldiers from your own hometown or from your own province. And please know that we would, we would love to be able to have it where everybody is researching the soldiers uh, from their hometown. Ultimately, that's exactly what we'd want to do. The Library and Archives doesn't work that way. Uh, they are actually digitizing the files alphabetically, so that becomes a problem if, you, if that's something that you're wanting to do. And they pulled off the off, uh, the ability to actually order uh, the Great War files now because that would interfere with the digitization process. Yeah, so the app will be able to break down the data for us, as long as we sort of have those uh, key ideas built ahead of time. Um, but we can also do that on the website so that you don't need an app for it. So right now, there are actually two different computer programming classes that I'm working with. Uh, the grade 11 students that I'm working with currently are working on an app, and they're gonna, going to be building essentially the database and the collection of data into an iPad app. And the grade 12 students that I'm working with are building the app itself. So how, what do you do with all of that data? And, uh, how do you manipulate it? And how do we show a soldier and digitally breathe life into them? Did you want to talk about the, the potential of that, uh, that platform program with the soldier and pulling data off of that? Yeah, so one of my students, actually in the business class, this is not even one of my computer science students, is working in his project there was a, a new game engine, a video game engine, that was just released, and it was uh, released for free. So any, anyone can go get it. It's called Unreal Game Engine. And what he's looking at right, right now is to, he's trying to develop a video game that mimics the, the Battle of Vimy Ridge. So he's uh, looking at ballistics, and he's looking at uh, the contours of the ridge itself, and from a ge geography perspective. And what he's trying to do is to build soldiers based on the data that's inside the database. So for instance, uh, to create um, a character inside a video game that is five foot eight, that has red hair, that has a scar on his left cheek, and we're just seeing if, if it's possible to be able to do that. And then if it is possible, can we somehow use that data inside our app and to have some sort of simulation that we're working through. And there's some great ideas that the students are coming up that are tied into that. And Joanne, your question about uh, you've got all kinds of files and you know what do you, what do you want to do with the, the, the files or the data that's in the files, the, the database is not limited to Vimy. It will, it will take all 619,584 Canadians uh, so uh, the goal again is that by the time we're done, not just with Vimy, but done with all of this, is that the database will actually represent every Canadian that was in the Great War. And you can have your students uh, input the data for that as well. So the way that the search engines work or the way that the database works is that you can actually try to the data is so specific, let's say like tattoos, scars, eye color, hair color, height, weight, religion, home, uh, medical records, uh, battalion, uh, medals that they received. It's really the database is really a, a reflection of the actual primary evidence document. So 
anything that you have from files, Joanne, can be put into the database. And uh, like everything else, if there's something that you realize is missing, then please feel free to recommend that, and then I can update it and add extra fields if we need to. So, Craig, your question about uh, in the Great War or killed in the Great War, uh, right now, uh, it's it's not necessarily for killed in the Great War. The 619,584 represent everybody that enlisted in the Great War. And there is no Privacy Act on any of that. Um, yeah, certainly. I mean, that's a great idea to put in medal winners um, and highlight some of the Victoria Cross winners. Um, the, there is a place inside the database that allows you to uh, insert different types of metals or, um, yeah, so it's quite possible to take that information and we can definitely highlight those soldiers. Some of the ideas that the students are coming up with is having sort of a soldier of the hour inside the app, so you'd open up the app and it would highlight one of the soldiers that participated in the Battle of Vimy Ridge. Um, and then you can dial it in and actually take a look at, at their information and you can drill down and, and get extensive coverage of, of basically every single field that your students are entering into the database. <laughs> All right, so did you see what Dave was doing? Yeah, so Dave, if you have questions, we can actually just write a simple query to the database based on that, and we can sort of spit out any information that you want to take a look at, whether it's your soldiers or um, I think someone mentioned before, can we take a look at the age of battalions or the average age inside the different battalions that per participated, and we can definitely do that. So if you feed me your questions, then uh, we can definitely take take a look and drill down into the database for whatever you're looking for. Dave, that's a great idea too because it actually allows the kids as they are doing their research to do essentially do a compare and contrast with each other. How is my guy similar? So uh, just to give you an example, we had two, two uh, soldiers in my class that the students are researching and what happened was I'm getting back. Uh, what happened was that uh, as they were doing the research, one we were doing some sharing, and one of the students actually said, "Wait a minute, what's what's the father's name?" And then what's the mother's name? And as they were doing this, this is uh, Austin Wiseman, Sidney Carroll, uh, the two students. They actually realized that they were working with two brothers. So that uh, that idea of the XL really works well to share uh, possible connections that can be made even within your classroom. And I think that's like one of the big buzzwords right now is the big data and a lot of universities are now starting to offer programs where students specifically look at massive amounts of data and to try to come up with connections inside of it and how can you teach a computer to be able to do that and you know, within the next couple of years, we're going to have that big data, and it's going to be hard just to look at the data itself to find those connections. So that that's where your queries become essential. What are the things that you guys want to look at inside of it? Again, Blackie and I just want to emphasize the idea that we want this to be as as collaborative as possible, so that it is a national endeavor done across the country, of course, by teachers, by students, um, so that they are the custodians of this for the centennial of things. And if I can work with Blake, then anyone can work across the country. <laughs> That's true. Uh, yeah. Nothing wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, send me an email. And I will get you set up. Once again, thank you everybody for coming out. Thank you for bearing with the technical difficulties. Unfortunately, sometimes it does happen. Technology is not seamless yet, but maybe the app will be. <laughs> there it is. Oh, That's the hope. App will be. <laughs> well, if it's done by students and not us, then there's a better probability that it's going to happen.